Okay. Hey, hi everyone. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks for, for joining us. So I see that the list of uh, attendees is growing. So people are starting to, to, to join us. So we will probably just wait uh, another minute or so just to, to make sure people have time to, to join us. Cool. Yeah, it usually takes a couple minutes. People are like, um, you know, putting the go to webinar thing on. That and stuff. sounds reasonable. That's fine. Cool. Okay, so um, so just basically, uh, this panel is going to be hosted by Robert uh, and myself, Brahim. Uh, we we are both from WordB. Uh, WordB being uh, the maker of the end-to-end -end translation management system and CAT tool. So you will see Robert for now, but he might disappear since we have only uh, six uh, room for six uh, videos and we will be waiting for another panelist that will be joining in a, in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, right. So um, many life sciences localization providers and companies use WordB. Um, to uh, to manage all aspects of localization, um, back translation, linguistic validation, but we're not going to talk much about that today. Um, but if that's interesting to anybody, you can get in touch. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can write them in under questions on the uh, toolbox. So you should have like a little toolbox um, there. Um, and uh, we'll try to get to them um, toward the end or or maybe we'll address some of them during the call as well. Um, so before we uh, introduce the panelists, let's kick, kick things off uh, with a poll um, just to see uh, what the answers are there. Um, there it goes. Exactly. Do so I get the answer too? So normally you should be able to, oh. to see it. And I see that mm -hmm. some people are already uh, starting answering it. So that's good. So just uh, basically, we you have uh, multiple choices uh, available. So feel free to uh, to respond to um, uh, to give several answers at the same time. And uh, here's the question: What is the major challenge related to life sciences, uh, according to you or to your organization? So we'll give it a few more seconds to answer. Yes. It's too bad you can't vote, Gabrielle, because I know what you'd vote for. <laughs> <laughs> and I can very vote for true. you as well. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> oh, we'll see. <laughs> so I, I see the figures still uh, moving, so I, I'll, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. It's busy. <laughs> OK. So uh, OK, we have quite an amount of people who have uh, voted already. So I would uh, I would just share uh, some figures that are moving. So it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I So basically, uh, uh, about 46% of the attendees have uh, selected the recruitment, which is uh, option uh, number one. And then uh, more than 30% have answered uh, training and terminology. Uh, good for you, Gabrielle. Um, <laughs> I knew we, it. <laughs> We also have uh, the regulations that have been uh, selected by uh, about 23% of attendees. And finally, uh, processes, uh, 31% uh, approximately, just like training and term terminology, uh, pretty much. OK, so it's not moving anymore. So I guess that most people uh, have voted already. So I will simply close the poll. Thank you for that. OK. So, um, so before uh, cool. we, yeah, so now that we have uh, our poll ready, uh, and without further ado, I, I think we can uh, go uh, and present our panelists. So we are super excited to welcome uh, uh, our experts today for our panel series. Uh, I just want to take a moment to introduce, well, maybe you can take a moment to introduce yourself and, uh, and share a bit about the perspective you bring. So can, maybe we can start with you, uh, Renate. Okay, so my name is Renette Tainan and uh, I've been working in life sciences uh, for about 
12, almost 13 years now. Um, and I've been a project manager, a senior project manager, and now program manager. Um, based out of Switzerland, uh, but I started in the US and also have worked remotely in Spain. So a little bit all over, like, like all our clients, I'm sure. <laughs> So it, it, was it always like project manager related to life sciences already? Yeah, or? yeah it's all life sciences. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, what about you, Gabrielle? Uh, I'm Gabrielle, the, the director of TermNet, the International Network for Terminology. And we did a lot of consultancy, large scale projects for life science companies, uh, multi corporations. <laughs> multinational corporations mostly and we did a lot of trainings uh, of uh, of people you know of of staff um, not necessarily only uh, translation and uh, localization experts and, and technical writers uh, but also the you know uh, all kinds of of uh, stakeholders in that in that localization uh, project so Hundreds of them actually are, are certified. We do also qualification and certification in terminology, a terminology driving license, if you wish. So, and there, there we got a lot of case studies, of course, you know, and a lot of uh, real life examples. What are the challenges? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about you, Olga? Um, our company was founded by a group of physicians back in 1995 in Russia. It grew out of the need to produce high quality and up-to-date translations because, you know, before 1995, the presence of Russia on international research scene was less and mm -hmm. so was in flux of new terminology. So we still have been focusing on life sciences, uh, mainly on linguistic validation and medical mm -hmm. translations. So your company's name uh, Preference, Preference Pro? Pro, yes. Sorry. So if I'm not wrong now, uh, the most of your company members are in the US right now, or is it? We have a group of translators who are always local okay. and medical professionals. So in every country, we try to build a team of medical professionals and translators, and they all reside in the target countries. I see. But our headquarters are in the US. Okay, sounds good. David? Yeah, hi there. <laughs> Hi there, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation to take part today. Um, I come from a medical communications background, so previously as a, a technical writer, a medical writer, um, working for pharmaceutical companies, and more recently have set up a, a company called Lay Summaries Limited, and uh, that's focusing on providing layperson summaries of clinical trial results, which is basically in response to a, a regulation from the, the EU, which I can talk about in a bit more detail. But um, so I suppose I straddle the content and the, the, the translation to an extent, or the localization, as I see the, the terminology that, that, that seems to be used. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. So we, our uh, fifth panelist uh, is uh, Mladen from Cyclopea. So he, he should be joining uh, now in uh, in the coming minutes. So I think we can maybe uh, kick things off. Uh, so let's have just an overview of uh, maybe as a uh, as a first area to cover today uh, of the different types of services in the life sciences and uh, medical field where you you are maybe active right now. Uh, I don't know who wants to 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 kick it off. Maybe Olga. Okay. Uh, we are made we, special. I just want to, to maybe uh, uh, give you some background. So uh, here we have a, uh, a list of attendees uh, uh, that uh, might be in the business for quite some time. We, we may have also some language, uh, uh, language uh, LSPs or uh, MLVs that might uh, simply consider um, uh, entering the, the medical field in the coming uh, in the future. So it's just that not everyone will be uh, fully specialized in this domain, but it's good, I think, to, to just have a, a, an idea of what type of services we might find in the, in the, in, uh, in the medical industry. So you, you can go ahead. Okay, so we are mostly specialized in linguistic validation. I can talk more about it, but I think uh, most people are familiar with the process, right? Uh, well, you, you can maybe well, we'll we'll elaborate. Uh, not not me. Late. Not me. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, linguistic validation is uh, usually refers to quality of life questionnaire and self-assessment. 
questionnaire, uh, so it's basically intended for patients because uh, patient subjective assessment to their condition becomes more and more important in clinical trials and medical research. Back, and I'm talking about 40 years back, when you test a new drug, two versions of drug, you compare the physical um, criteria, and it mostly I'm talking about uh, long-term conditions. Mm -hmm. So now, with the choice of therapies, we would like to choose such a therapy which is also uh, provides for better quality of life. If you need to stay in a hospital, and I'm exaggerating right now, but basically if you need to stay in a hospital all the time to receive a therapy as opposed to being at home, then maybe the one which is maybe slightly less effective but allows you to stay at home is better. So this questionnaire become more and more important and uh, uh, they're vital points of research. So we want to make sure that the translated and validated versions, the great deal of them was developed in the US, is accurate in terms of language, uh, in terms of terminology, and also in terms of culture-specific realities. Okay. So, the, so this is going to be your main, uh, uh, your main uh, type of uh, expertise. And besides uh, linguistic validation, is there any other? Uh... Yes, we do medical translations, all kinds of uh, um, clinical trial-related documents. We can also help with submissions, we have DTP service, um, things like that. And, and more traditional services. Okay. Yes. Uh, what about you, Gabrielle? Hmm. Uh, well, as, as I said, we, we mainly do consultancy and training. We've seen a lot of uh, case studies where uh, a very small num number of language experts is doing language services for huge multinational <laughs> corporations. No? And what puzzled us and still is, is that the awareness of safety and security of quality, you know, is extremely high, of course, in, in life sciences and, and medical device manufacturers, for instance. But the awareness of the importance, yeah, if not the critical success factor of language and terminology still is surprisingly low. So, so, so this is kind of an um, interesting uh, uh, issue and, and it's so different from automotive industry, for instance, yeah? because maybe, yeah, maybe it is because the end clients yeah, are different. Because when you buy a car, yeah, the user manual is part of the product and the end user is the driver, the buyer of the car. And you, you couldn't deliver the product, the car, without having the user manual localized, yeah, translated into the, the language of the target markets. Yeah? So maybe this is why the awareness for, for also decent terminology and, and consistent, correct uh, uh, terminology in the source language is so much higher uh, in the automotive industry than in 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 the medical industry it's it, they catch up now yeah but actually this is uh, uh, quite uh, a paradox I, I think yeah that mm -hmm. as i said on the one hand wow all these actually mm -hmm. over regulations and standards and you know measurements and whatnot you know and on the other hand uh, so little awareness of, of language issues and, and the, the knowledge that and the understanding that, that it really it is so crucial, in particular what, what Olga just said, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, if there is no understanding of the patient, yeah, that's highly uh, risky, of course. You know? mm -hmm. what, what about you, David? Uh, so, you, so, David, you, um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I was, I was Maybe just about delay. to say, so you, so you yeah, David, do you, the... do, you, do you agree? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, yeah. uh, Robert. Yeah, so yeah do, you agree, about... do you agree, <laughs> David? Because you, you have a background in tech writing, so. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I suppose my, my yeah, obviously you need to understand um, the, the perspective of the end user um, who, who's going to be kind of consuming your material, if you like, and, and understanding their position. Um, and we can get into a bit more of that about, you know, the science versus the, the layperson terminology. But I suppose in terms of the services that I have experience in previously would be um, kind of traditional medical communications in the sense of publications. So mm -hmm. the writing up of um, trial results for publication in journals, uh, presentations at conferences, mm -hmm. 
so kind of on the publication side and then on the meeting side things like um training for medical teams within pharmaceutical companies uh, running advisory boards with with doctors to get their perspective on um uh, you know the, the drugs and the, the findings and the trial results and such like but no i absolutely agree with uh, with, with the points made there about understanding who who is going to be um kind of the main target of your output and tailoring it appropriately to their needs. Uh, Renate. Yeah, um, well, the company I work for, we do everything to do with life sciences. So we do, uh, you know, regulatory content, clinical, we do language validation. So we cover the whole, you know, a gamut of, of services there. We do interpreting, everything. Um, we, we, you know, we also cover the side of marketing, you know, for life sciences companies. So basically anything that they need, they, they can come to us and we provide. <laughs> So Renate, uh, just to, it, of course, it's a big industry. So uh, mm -hmm. we just want to have an idea of the type of companies or institutions that would uh, request such services. Uh, well, so could you maybe just give us some uh, overview? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I prefer not to name names. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I mean, they're, they're on our website, actually, so I suppose I probably could. But um, I mean, any large pharma that you can think of, go to your medicine cabinet and grab a, uh, you know, a package and, and look at who the manufacturer is. And, and uh, those are companies that we're very likely working with. Um, mm -hmm. Also medical device, you know, so you go to a hospital and I can't go to hospitals anymore. If I go in and I see, you know, a certain machine, I'm like, mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this person read the manual, you know, that we translated. So, um, so you know, is, so it, is it primarily like uh, privately held uh, companies or do you also happen to work with uh, uh, public uh, organizations? Uh, mainly private, but there's also public. Yeah, but yeah. It's okay. Kind of both, yeah. What, what about what about the rest of you? Uh, do you also uh, primarily work with uh, privately held companies or do you sometimes do some work for, uh, I don't know, local hospitals or uh, governments? Mm -hmm. Maybe David? Yeah, I, I think for me, it would be in the same camp as um, Ronate in that, and I think it stems from the fact that private companies have the the budgets to be, you know, taking on, you know, partners and agencies to be doing this type of work. Whereas, you know, I, maybe a university or a a, a public um, organisation would would keep these things in house, or perhaps uh, just wouldn't have the budgets to to be able to outsource these sorts of um, kind of activities. Okay, um, David, can you maybe walk, walk us through the, the content creation side of life sciences? Because uh, I think you have some background there. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I suppose the, the, the model that I'm familiar with and, and, and have worked with would be as a, an agency partnering with a, um, with a client, you know, a, a very kind of standard model. Um, and the client would in, in employ us to develop their materials. And so you would you would take a brief from them, depending on what the project was, mm -hmm. and try to understand what, what exactly is it that you're looking for um, in, in the end. And then I think what's kind of, I don't know if it's unique necessarily about the pharmaceutical industry, but um, the, the, because it's in such a regulated environment, um, things are very controlled and processes are very controlled and um, so, so I mean, you, you on developing your 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 content, it would go through five to ten other people's hands on the client side before it ever saw the light of day. Um, you know, it would be it would be heavily reviewed and scrutinised. It wouldn't just be kind of one or two people look at it and say that's fine. It would mm -hmm. it would go through a number of different steps, and then um, you know the legal team would have to sign off as well, and 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 that has its own kind of interesting uh, nuances as well. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, the, you know, my experience as the writer would be developing that content, uh, liaising with the client, and also sometimes because there's an interesting kind of triangle in that you would have the client, the agency, and we also work with doctors as well. So it's not just a two-way thing, it would be a three-way thing. 
and there's kind of interesting relationships there as well about um, you managing that process and, and managing those expectations uh, and making sure you get the right sign-offs at the right point and, and all that, that sort of thing. And, and David, do you have a language process, a terminology process also? Well, in it, all these processes, how, how do you how do yeah. you handle a uh, language in the in in this uh, you know automated way even? Yeah, yeah, sure. So most um, most pharmaceutical companies, particularly who have an established drug um, or at least a drug that's at approval and going to launch, would should have some sort of agreed scientific lexicon. So they'll have a way. A set, a set language that they will use to describe the mm -hmm. disease state, to, de, to describe okay. the, yeah. the mechanism of action of the drug, to describe how the, the, the trial setup has been done, to describe the endpoints and the, the, the outcome measures, to describe the adverse events. Everything around that that they want to communicate, they, they will have a, a kind of agreed uh, lexicon to to um to, to follow and so and, and one of that i suppose is it's branding isn't it that they want a certain um you know if someone reads some things they'll know that's by this xyz company or if they read something else you say well that's how this company describes it and it, it, it provides ingrained patterns into you know the, the the consumer if you like and um, but that that then brings up interesting questions when you then talk about um the, the lay summary side of things so how do we describe these these um, concepts and terms to people who, who aren't familiar with them? So, you know, to you and I, um, or maybe not, I don't know, an adverse event, we would know what that is, but to the man on the street, they have no idea what an adverse event is, or or even, you know, placebo, we know what placebo is, a, you know, a phase three trial, any of these things that, that come as second nature to someone in the industry that, that has a lot of kind of connotation and immediate, um, you know, connections with it would mean nothing to, to, to someone. So, and I think, you know, that this kind of lay language stuff is still quite early days. And I think there will be a lot of sort of uh, feeling out how to, to, to um, deal with these challenges of the agreed scientific lexicon versus lay language and, 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 and how clients, how comfortable they are with using um, kind of different terminology to describe their, 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 their drugs. In fact, so, that relates to a question we just got from uh, one of our attendees, which is, uh, at what point does uh, terminology enter the medical content writing process? So maybe you want to comment on that, uh, Gabrielle? Mm -hmm. Well, usually, you know, if the awareness is already high, people ask mm -hmm. us how to uh, uh, how to to provide uh, standardized language you know that the, all these lexica snow made and, and all the 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 standardized terminology is out there of course but in, in it, the the field is so huge you cannot expect expect that you have a uh, an agreed standardized terminology accept the terminology uh, for every field of your activities yeah mm -hmm. so there is still a, a, a lack and of course uh, a large company yeah, with all these stakeholders, yeah, uh, from technical writer, content producers, product managers, uh, all the way down to the translators, to the to the after sales, for instance, people, yeah, uh, they have to agree on a common joint uh, corporate terminology, and so the actually it should start at the very uh, first stage, yeah. And, and, when when the when the content is created, yeah, uh, but there it's it's very transversal, it's very interdisciplinary, if you wish. In in uh, various people, as David pointed out earlier, various people are always involved. Yeah, these are the 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 core stakeholders from the very beginning, and that's why we need a process to standardize the mechanisms. You know, mm -hmm. how to agree, mm -hmm. how to come up with the need for a new term or to amend correct or even delete yeah, obsolete terms yeah, how to define new concepts yeah, and this this needs to be standardized in in such a way that uh, these core people know which steps they they have to follow and it's it's not only you know about these prescriptive tools we're, we're always uh, ask before uh, how, but what tools of course there are authoring tools that's not the problem but uh, we try to really make people understand that first it's about the people 
you need to uh, to get the buy-in of those people really concerned with creating terminology yeah processing it uh, handling it mm -hmm. managing it uh, uh, all the way down to the, to you know the the end uh, user and then actually comes the processes and when you manage to integrate language and terminology processes in the existing landscape of processes and we are in the business very in, in the, the, the subject is very uh, you know over regulated actually they have tons of processes so as a new standalone process of how to handle uh, language and terminology this is not a good option it, mm -hmm. we need to integrate you know in other quality related processes we need to integrate uh, uh, these language uh, processes and terminology processes then actually it it, it's really smooth then. So, um, uh, Renette, um, at, at RWS, um, how do how do you manage terminology, and and how does how you do terminology connect with how your clients do terminology or content creators um, mm -hmm. like David? For for my group, we do um, basically. There's there's several ways, but. It depends also on the maturity level of the, the client that we're working with, because some of them actually have terminology departments, uh, which is very exciting when I see yeah. that. Lucky you, lucky you. Then then no. your work is way easier. Yeah, it? it is. It, it is. It is. And, and you know then that the results, they're going to be happier with the results as long as you're using the, you know, what they're giving yeah. you to you know, but um, it's also kind of vaguely uh, Orwellian, you know, like <laughs> the, yeah. the Ministry of Terminology or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, other, otherwise, uh, we have, um, you know, we, we do create our own glossaries, you know, that we share with with our teams. You know, we have we do use core teams for a lot of um, a lot of the clients that we work with. So we, we are kind of narrow the pool in a sense of people that we use um for the ones that we need to uh and uh and you know constant updating there's there's with some clients you have um agreements you know of when do they want to sort of revise the terminology that we're maintaining for them uh so we have processes again to you know make sure that we are hitting those milestones you know that we've set to hit um, and there are other clients where they don't want to get involved at all, you know, they just kind of, you deal with it, here's the mm -hmm. translation, you know, throw it over the fence and I just want it back when you're done, you know, so th there's all kinds, you know, uh, of, of um, uh, you, you know, of, of involvement or non-involvement there so you know at the same time we're we're in the in the business of providing uh, you know quality so so all our our linguists know how to use you know terminology bases and you know we, we provide training when needed and you know we make sure that we are hitting those quality you know benchmarks that we've set for ourselves yeah and uh, as it was said before, so basically we understand that people uh, are, are at the center of uh, everything, uh, and uh, and we hear that they, they, there seems to be a variety of uh, stakeholders, uh, which is uh, pretty so diverse compared to more traditional uh, translation and localization services. So, so could you maybe give us an idea of uh, the, the type of stakeholders you work with and uh, how do you manage to have them all uh, uh, work together, in fact? So may, maybe Olga, if, uh, you can, can you comment on that? Uh, basically, we uh, approach each project individually. We assess geographic location and okay. based on what resources are available in this country for medical or life science translations. In some countries, there is a vast number of resources. So mm -hmm. a translator with uh, doing due diligent research can actually come up with a good translations. And then, of course, we have reviews and quality. But in some countries where these resources are not readily available, we create a team of subject matter experts that check literally every single line mm -hmm. because otherwise it's impossible medical dictionaries may be out of date and online resources are uh, misleading to say this least so are are you referring to people that have a, 
uh, both uh, expert expertise in, in, a, in the medical field and linguistic background? Or do they have to have both? Or can it be no, just... No, you have to have two. One with a strong linguistic background, a professional translator with experience in life sciences. Mm -hmm. And another just sometimes a doctor. And uh, so the doctor reviews the terminology, it goes back to the translator, and the step by step uh, glossary terminology content is established. Okay. But unfortunately, in some countries, and including in Russia, you would think that by now they should have sufficient resources, but they don't. They don't have a specialization at um, universities such as medical translators, just general translations. Mm -hmm. So, taking it all together, they really need a huge input from the doctors. Okay. Mm -hmm. including just sometimes consultations as an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So you could solve it in the beginning and have a good stepping stone mm -hmm. follow the rest of the process, which is standard, you know, language quality inspections, reviews, assessments that you can manage according to the budget, timeline and the needs. But the key is to get a good start. Mm, okay. You can't, we don't rely on review at the later stages or creating a glossary at the later stages because, mm -hmm. uh, although uh, the input from medical, it's an investment, but it uh, provides a better quality, a good quality, okay. and uh, mm. it pays back. I mean. Are you ISO certified, Olga, if I may ask you, ISO so 17100? Are you ISO 17100 certified? We are not yet, but we are not yet. But our translators now basically they pass the yeah. uh, requirements. Yeah. So for all our because clients, we are ready least, to. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least this definitely raises the overall quality and the processes because this this process of revision, the the four eyes principle, and then also yes. review, it's 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 quite uh, prescribed in in that standard. So it, it helps yes, a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And what about uh, you, Rene? Yes, uh, no, is your company definitely yeah. ISO certified? We have three ISO certifications, so yeah, we get audited regularly. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, usually clients are very picky in in life yeah. sciences, but as you as you said earlier, there is still and, and that was what was I was referring to. There is still this attitude of as you described it so, mm -hmm. so nicely. Yeah? So uh, here is the text. Uh, go away, translate it, bring it back, and we do not care. And this is still, I think, uh, a, a huge challenge and the risk because if this is the attitude yeah, uh, of of life science companies, then uh, it's it's very hard because you are never the only LSP language service yeah, provider. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I I met companies they had dozens they have more than 20 language service providers and my job <laughs> has been to really to clarify uh, what the, is the quality of their work and how do how many do we need and so on and so forth and of course the first step was always that I, I really recommend uh, ISO 17100 certification mm -hmm. then of course also the the terminology uh, literacy and, and terminology certificates uh, etc and and actually having I, I always recommend that they shall build that these large corporations that they shall build their own language and, and uh, terminology teams yeah? uh, of course they end up then with the uh, three people yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> responsible for uh, 30,000 uh, employees and, and you know uh, but at mm. least this is a beginning and and uh, as, as as we said earlier at least it makes your life then very much easier if you have this group of of, of language uh, experts within the company and then then you really can make sure that uh, there is not this you know uh, a horrible mess we we end up when we have so many uh, language service providers mm -hmm. not knowing of course uh, from each other and, and in many cases also the various stakeholders the departments they do not know about uh, mm -hmm. each other's activities and they do not mm -hmm. uh, have you know a, a, a common uh, term base or, or not even a glossary yeah for their own brand names so this is actually what we're talking about yeah? uh, of course there is so, you, you have more advanced uh, companies you have less advanced but uh, yeah. uh, in principle there is still something um, i'm i'm really surprised and, and puzzled of, of what's going on in, in in quite large corporations you know 
and, well, and I, even I also think, uh, also in the in the nonprofit world, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the, these large uh, yeah. networks, uh, yeah, are. But but they they struggle more with the multilingualism, of course, and so their awareness is way higher. If you're an international mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization in these fields, you you're quite you know uh, aware mm -hmm. of of language issues. Well, I, you know, and I, I think it's um, what Olga said was really interesting, too, about how, um, you know, doing these, these providing these services in different countries, um, you know, depending on the resources that are available there, um, it affects how you provide the service and exactly. what services that exactly. you can provide. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm not sure that this is exactly the right audience for the question, but um, is any, has anyone ever been involved with um, deciding um, in which countries to launch a new product or, or for example, launching a new life sciences product or helping a client do it in a country where they've never done anything before and they're just starting from zero? Um, I, I mean, I've helped clients do this, but not, not, I don't know if they had no absolute zero contact in the country before, you know, but I, but mm -hmm. I have had clients launch, uh, launch products into a new market, you know, where they, and for example, we do a lot of uh, in-country review, you know, for, for clients. So they didn't have somebody in the country, for example, that mm -hmm. could help them with the, with reviewing their own products. So then we help them mm -hmm. to, you know, to to through a process that would that would help allow them to have some sort of a review so that they could mm -hmm. launch the product, meeting their own regulations again and their own processes that they have to have something reviewed before and signed mm -hmm. off before they can go ahead and launch. You know, so. Right. It takes you know so, a little a lot of planning and and it takes a little longer to run the project as you can imagine but right. but it gets done I mean new new countries are added uh, not all the time but they are added. Uh, so let's get a little bit specific here because we we have a question over here um, from Max Deckers he says why is the approach unique for life sciences much of what is being said could be true for other domains as well. Yeah. And I think that's because we haven't gotten very specific <laughs> about processes yet. So um, before we get into recruitment and training, which is the biggest problem that everyone has, and we have to talk about that too, um, let's, let's, let's skip to processes then. Um, and let's go on to the localization side here. Um, so let's talk about things like parallel translation, back translation. Let's, let's explain like some of these you know, heavy, heavy and unique processes um, for localization. Um, and anyone who wants to jump on that, I, I guess either Olga or, or Renette probably. I think I think language validation is one of the most complicated, at least that I know. So maybe let Olga talk about. Okay, all right. Basically, uh, so as I said before, we need to make sure that uh, the produced translation is uh, linguistically and culturally equivalent to the original. Uh, so it should be the same tone, the same register. It should uh, if uh, it should be written in a fairly simple language, most of the time as it is intended for patients. So to do so, uh, we produce two forward translations done by two independent translators. And then the person who supervises locally the entire project, let's call this person language lead or language coordinator, language lead, uh, he or she creates a single translations based on the two translations. The idea is to minimize the possibility of an accidental mistake and also, you know, just to benefit from input from several individuals. But uh, then uh, the produced translation has been uh, translated by a native English speaker or depends which language, let's English speaker, just to facilitate the discussion. And then um, the lead linguist compares item by item, including headers and footers, the original and the back translation, and explains all the discrepancies. Uh, the goal is twofold. First of all, to analyze the text and to allow parties who don't speak the target language to participate in the discussion. For example, it could be the author of the questionnaire who would like to know what's going on with his instrument. 
and also it's to document every decision make. So part of it, it's more creative and uh, based on linguistic analysis, but we also need to document every decision made. Then uh, usually it is being sent to clinicians specialized in the area of interest. The clinicians are supposed to check uh, professional terminology and also if the language used in a questionnaire is consistent with that used in doctor-patient communications. Sometimes the translation is correct, but it's not how the doctors would normally ask their patients this same question. Do you feel tired in the morning? Do you feel weak in the morning? It's subtle differences, but the patients need to hear something familiar. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the instrument is being presented to five, usually five or 10 individuals from the target group. And the content is being discussed item by item. Basically, we ask to explain what each item means in their own world. And then uh, just regular proofreading, usually double proofreading, two rounds, and uh, language sign off, final check of the formatted file. So, in brief, this is it. It's a big process. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Would you add anything, Renette? Yeah, I just think that's, uh, I mean, for other translations that, that I've worked on in other industries, it's it's not um, it's not that quality is not important because it is important, but it's so crucial in life sciences. I mean, if you if you get a comma wrong, you you know it could almost kill somebody, or maybe it could. I don't know, you know. So it's really. It's, it's very, very uh, important, you know, to 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 have. Uh, there's a lot of risk basically involved in the translations, so you have to have a lot of uh, steps throughout the process to control, you know, that everything is, you know, within a controlled environment, you know, that it that it's working and that it's going to be fine at the end. And there's a lot of people, as you can imagine, that touch that text throughout when we get it, you know, to, to start the translation until we deliver. I mean, you have, it goes through, you know, DTP, through proofers, through linguists that are translating, it's going through Trados, it's going, you know, to, to, to other tools, you know, it's, it's going through all kinds of tools. So anything could get dropped, you know, logos get dropped, commas get dropped, you know, there, there's characters that get corrupted and then you can't read the text. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, you know, exaggerating, but, you know, there could be one word in there that suddenly you can't read and it's a crucial word in the sentence. So you have to have all these quality steps to catch, you know, catch anything that goes away from, from what the uh, intended result is, you know, so I think that's what I find is is very different you know from other other industries that i've worked with you know and there were real life cases then the date of the clinical studies had to be thrown away because of the yeah. mistake you mistake uh, in a protocol mm -hmm. it did happen it's not just mm -hmm. potential you know yeah 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 uh, you know, from my helicopter view, let's say, I, I, I also audited uh, many, many translation companies all over the world with, I'm an ISO 17100 auditor. Okay. So uh, I can tell you that actually there is not so much specifics in the life sciences mm -hmm. as life science itself uh, always claims and really want to hear. My clients, they, they just want to benchmark uh, with other life sciences companies. And I'm, I'm careful yeah, with, uh, with uh, uh, stating that, but look, this is, very, this is a, a very common <laughs> uh, trait in, in many other uh, industries where safety and security matters, such as aviation, you know, such yeah. as software engineering. If you have clients that are so picky that uh, with these commas, yeah, that reminded me to audits where, wow, these companies, these language service uh, providers, they really, they overdid the, the ISO 17100. The, the requirements were quite, you know, uh, low in that standard compared to the requirements of their picky clients. And, and that's the same for, for some life sciences companies. But... Uh, Actually, you know, if you if you think about automotive, aviation, all these other highly safety and security uh, focused industries, 
you always have to make sure yeah, that the, 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 the amount of mistakes is very, very low. And you have to check, you have to uh, audit, you have to, you know, double check with, with all the relevant stakeholders involved. This is, uh, if, if I am allowed to, to say so, it's, it's pretty common in a lot of other industries. The only thing, and I, I was thinking while you were uh, uh, sharing these great examples with us the only uh, specifics i encountered you know uh, was actually medical interpreting <laughs> the, because because it was not only in it was real life and sometimes in really very dangerous you know life threatening environments uh, and this was really a, a huge challenge uh, psychological challenge for those great interpreters you know i met interpreters uh, uh, after the, the the earthquake in christchurch in new zealand uh, a couple of years ago and and we were discussing what what is really so you know important to have as an as an uh, ability and knowledge and skills and competences when when you you're doing medical interpretation in such an environment. And, and I think this is then very specific because there you need specific training, you need uh, psychological, you know, uh, training and, and you have to have some, so, and there is even a, a great ISO standard um, uh, we have uh, about so-called community interpretation. Yeah, it's, it's not only focused on medical, but but with a, with a, with a you know, with, with some some focus they have on, on medical interpretation you know uh, this I is would like maybe to... really different <laughs> but otherwise we, we we share these these uh, traits with uh, with a lot of other industries where where safety and security is a real issue just to just to jump in brahim for a second i, I wonder um i'd be interested to hear your thoughts whether another point of differentiation might be um an image uh, some around image um, and reputation given that certainly pharmaceutical companies are rightly or wrongly have there's perhaps been a negative image around them um, because of past practices and they're, they're on, there's a massive kind of uh, cleanup operation I don't think it's the right term but certainly a, a, a mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to display a, a cleaner image and i wonder if that might might have something uh, uh, certainly a point of differentiation and i wonder also you mentioned automotives earlier on that might be coming their way as well based on recent events uh, with <laughs> german car manufacturers yeah. but um, th that's perhaps another point of differentiation there as well but your point your point's really valid about the <clears throat> my mind jumped to the aviation industry as well and you know mm -hmm. aspects around safety and the importance of accuracy and um, you know you know uh, in that regard sorry brahim uh, it's fine I, I just wanted to take a, 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 a short moment just to introduce uh, madden who has been uh, able to join a few minutes ago i know he was waiting uh, for me to introduce him okay. um, so madden you so, will probably <clears throat> have to turn if you can just a moment please I, i'm turning off my camera so i am now a ghost in the <laughs> webinar <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi, uh, Mladen. We, we don't see you yet, um, so probably your uh, cam is not. It seems, it seems that my cam is uh, camera is ready. Just a moment. Yep. I yes. shared it. I shared it. This is my very first time, actually, that I'm participating <laughs> in webinars. So maybe I will have some technical issues. Uh, I apologize to everyone. I, I had a small small technical issues and problems uh, when I when I when I when I uh, when I go to my office. No problem. So, so I, I will um, share my screen then, um, and, and then until your screen works, Miladin. So Miladin, could, could you maybe uh, briefly dis uh, present, present yourself, uh, explaining a bit uh, of your background and uh, what your organization do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, here I'm representing Cyclopia. Uh, we are a company which is uh, present at the market for 15 years. Uh, I co-founded company together with my partner, uh, Sandra, and um, we started as a usual, as a as a average translation company. Uh, at the beginning, we do many things, uh, but uh, through the through the time, as a company uh, developed, uh, we specialized. 
uh, in certain verticals and uh, during especially during the couple of la last years uh, we, we we specialized uh, in life science uh, technology uh, mainly life science and technology sec verticals and sectors so um, that's 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 our approach and uh, and also our another specialization specialization is also also um, regional coverage and because we because uh, from the beginning we are we started from Croatia and uh, then expanded our our services to through the whole region mm -hmm. and um, that's why we we like to to present ourselves as a specialists for for um, certain verticals and certain languages that's 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 what we do okay in short i uh, so as we as we move forward, so we are receiving questions from attendees. We we receive uh, for Renate specifically, specifically, uh, which is uh, what quality models or profiles are most frequently used for measuring the linguistic quality in life sciences. Uh, well, we have we have. Um... We used to use the LISA model, which <laughs> they, they precede a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, attending. I don't know, um, but, but it, the ones that we use are kind of based out of that, uh, and they've, we've, they've developed our own. Basically, we have, um, but we 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 test our our linguists on a regular basis, uh, and and we we go through different. We have different points basically where where we test linguists and then we, we qualify them based on um, scores, you know, so there's a certain score that they have to meet and, you know, we go through, um, there, there's a, if you find something, you know, if you're the editor kind of going through the quality and, and, and finding something, then you qualify it as an omission, but, you know, and, and add a, a critical value to it, etc. You know, so there's all kinds of scoring going on. Um, we also use our own project managers who, who qualify the services, uh, mm -hmm. for example, of the linguists, you know, so if you're getting things late or you ask for, you know, five files on a TM and you only get four files and no TM, then, you know, you give this uh, uh, vendor a score, et cetera. So, I mean, there's a lot of, I don't know if, it, maybe the question's not specific enough. I don't know, you know, if that answers the question really. So, so you, so basically, since we were talking about this uh, unique approach uh, in comparison with uh, some other fields in the localization industry, so could you maybe uh, elaborate a bit on the the typical challenges related to recruitment for life sciences and the medical mm -hmm. industry? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how it's it goes, I guess, between from the the actual recruitment to, of people, but also maybe through training and. How do you keep people up to date with uh, all the information uh, they, they have to have about a certain project? Yeah, um, well, for projects, it's easy because it's a per project basis, right? So we always send instructions and, you know, whatever they else they need, glossaries, reference material, et cetera, et cetera, with each project. So it's on a okay. per project basis, okay. uh, but kind of zooming out of that. Um, so, I mean, recruiting, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a challenge for us, actually. Um, I mean, it is a or large organization. How, how different is that? Or, or maybe mm -hmm. the the recruitment. I mean, we do test translations, which is not new either for for other okay. industries. Uh, but we do have a very low pass rate, you know. So the tests are pretty rigorous, uh, and mm -hmm. of course, you have to meet a certain criteria before you even get sent a test, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, I think what's what's challenging, actually, that I would say from my point of view, uh, as having run projects and, and you know having a, a team of project managers that run projects right now, our main challenge with the with linguists really is that not only do they have to have this very specialized knowledge. Um, they need to know how to use tools and it's surprisingly, surprisingly, a lot of them just want to translate and, you know, we are moving very, very far away from there now. 
and it's getting more and more complex. I mean, even the way, you know, the, the projects that we have to handle, they're becoming more and more technical, you know, with all these CMSs, et cetera, and all these tools. And it's, you know, it's surprising sometimes to me that, that, that linguists are really struggling. And at the same time, it's not because you think, wow, they need to know all this stuff about, you know, medical, pharma, blah, blah, all this terminology. <laughs> then I'm, you know, we're asking them to like figure out how to work with all these different tools to, you know, to deal with all these different tags that look different in this tool than in the other, you know, then they need to deliver something completely different each time. You know, it, it's just, it's very challenging, actually, you know, I think. <laughs> for sure. them um and then it's for us too because then we realize oh maybe we should have you know trained them on this particular you know because we're used to seeing <laughs> how things change on a regular basis but they're not necessarily even though they're i would say an integral part of what we do every day we, we need these linguists we need the translators they're part of our team uh they're more removed in a sense you know and sometimes you have to remind everybody to like no you have to bring them in and make sure that they're, you know, also um, on the same page, kind of as, as, as you, you know, as what you're, you are asking of them, and what our clients are asking of us, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I find that that's really the challenge is not really so much recruiting. Uh, you know, maybe my vendor relations team would scream, <laughs> you know, right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think really it's and also maintaining, you know, the the linguists interested in working in these projects are becoming more and more technical as well. You know, as far as fiddling around with stuff more than tran actually translating. You know, and then if we get into MT, that's a whole <laughs> a whole other, a whole other <laughs> webinar. <laughs> <laughs> what, what how about, about you, uh, Yeah, uh, I was gonna say, how about you, Olga? But also, we we got to hear from David on this too. Um, I so would agree how, with Lynette. Recruitment is not. I mean, recruitment is part of life. We all have to recruit, and uh, we want to get the best translators, and we do the test translations and all. But I agree about the technical part of it. Especially <laughs> considering that I understand the translator's standpoint, because every client now or theirs requires new set of skills. And you have to learn it yourself. No matter how many times you watch the demonstration, you have to try it to learn to use the tool. You can't remember, you know. Uh, so it's a little bit, but I think people are getting used to it, actually. I think it's getting better. Because I remember even about five years ago, there were translators who just did not want to use certain tools or learn new mm -hmm. tools and it would stay so openly. But now I think everyone is coming to realization that it's a future and a present actually. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. So okay. I no longer hear as many complaints as before. <laughs> now, now the next challenge will be the post-editing of machine translation. I know, I know, I know. I know. Artificial intelligence <laughs> coming in. Ooh. <laughs> and there is again, there is a, a brand new ISO standard uh, about machine about um, post-editing, and and from that and and. and uh, interesting enough, you know, uh, we have uh, clients from the U.S. only so far. I think only from the U.S. who uh, who got certified yeah, against this new standard, and they reported that really, which is an indicator, I think, that this is really the future, you know, <laughs> and uh, or at least the the, uh, the great trend, the real trend. Uh, but they reported that they, you know, had uh, so many troubles to find to find translators who were willing mm. to do this post editing so the reputation of post editing is so low you know and but funny enough uh, actually that when they then did it yeah and uh, got the benefits out of it they quite changed also their, their attitude of course and then recommended it <laughs> forward that it's it's not such a night nightmare as as they expected it to be but uh, yeah seriously mm. I think that uh, the sheer amount of, of um, text, you know, uh, we face in uh, 
in all kinds of industry, but of course also in, in uh, life sciences, uh, will will just uh, force us to uh, you know to think about alternatives to uh, mm -hmm. to human translation. And, and as long as, as humans are the past editors, I would say we should be on the safe side, and we should you know and with all these tools, you know, we we should. Uh, we should benefit from the from the further development and the improvement mm. of of these tools because otherwise we will end up uh, or we get stuck actually we risk to get stuck in 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 delays in all these very costly processes you know you you all know you know and uh, time is you know is still very very important and it's it's very mm -hmm. uh, important to to re react you know if you think about all these you know um, issues we have when we launch uh, a product in, in, in life sciences and medical fields, you know, you, you need to react mm. very fast then, you know. So uh, I think this this will surely be one one option for the future that we we actually have more past editors than, <laughs> and revisers and, you know, all, all, all kinds mm -hmm. of, of, of new types of or new job profile of, of, of translators. And the, the younger generation, I think, is, is ready for, for, for that development. So, David, uh, on the content creation side, so so you've got lay summaries, right? And yep. um, and you're you're starting lay summaries. How 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 soon? How long ago did you start lay summaries? So it's been in 2017. Yeah, it wasn't it, not too long ago. So it's mm -hmm. it's quite and and uh, that's in response to a a change in regulation at the EU level, which is going to hopefully hit at the end of this year. Um, which will make these, these uh, lay summaries mandatory um, in wh whatever a trial has been run in a, a, an EU state. So um, that's, they're going to require translations as well because the, the, the source document will probably be English and it will be taken from, it will, it, it will essentially be a lay translation from the kind of technical trial summary. And then um, from there, it will be translated into the language of each trial site. Uh, in in the mm. European states, so yeah, we have all these fun and games to to look forward to. I think in in due course. So how about recruitment then? So you you know you're, you're starting this new enterprise. Um, you have a super cool idea and a super cool niche. Um, yeah. so how is how is recruitment going for you? For you know, because a lot of the the other panelists have you know established companies. So how, how is it for you? Yeah, I mean, for, more from past experience than now, I think with the kind of technical medical writers, um, I think there's a bit of a merry-go-round. So the same people go around the same companies, I think. And uh, <laughs> I think they're, they're kind of trying to, I think finding writers is easy enough. I think finding good writers is, is difficult. Uh, and so I've, I've seen a trend. I've seen a trend now for companies kind of setting up these academies whereby they, they, they target the universities and they try and get the graduates straight from the university into a kind of training program. So it's becoming more professionalized in that sense, which I think is good. Um, and there's some, some good practice going on there. With, with regards to recru recruiting a specialist lay summary writer, <laughs> I think that's a different, a different ballpark altogether. So, um, you know, I've, I've, been, <laughs> I've been on the lookout for a while now for people with those specific skills, because I think there's maybe a conception that uh, it's just a case of dumbing down the scientific content, but it's actually not. It's it, it, it's quite a nuanced process that's, that's, that takes a, a kind of honed skill set. And there are actually very few people out there who have experience in doing, in doing it. I think the most um, kind of relevant skill set that's probably out there is people who have worked on um, patient information sheets and consent forms for trials um, and I think that's a kind of closest parallel to to um, to, to what we're doing but watch this space eh? I'll come back to you maybe in eight years time <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll update you on my answer <laughs> Well, so if there's any uh, attendees who are who are thinking, "Wow, I could be the one um, that has <laughs> get, get in touch, um, get in touch with David." Thank you. Yeah. I'd be keen to know. I wonder a question for these guys with uh, translation experience in for English. So obviously, with lay summaries, one of the key things is to get the language to a level that's understandable to the, the person on the street. And one of the things there is to get it to a kind of a grade level or a certain re readability level mm -hmm. um, for which there is the, I think it's a flesh Kincaid readability scale for English. 
I just wondered what are the similar tools for different languages that you can use for readability? And are there, uh, do all languages have these or are they modified versions or are they, some languages don't have them? You know, what's the, the status? Some languages certainly don't, not all languages do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we go to patients and show them mm -hmm. the material. Uh, because sometimes it's uh, clear uh, that it's a technical term that is not likely to be understood, but also for patients who experience this condition, sometimes they know more than you think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah. making it too simple and using something uh, weird you made up instead of using a standard familiar term also is not a good solution. Yeah, you sure. really need this feedback for many languages we work with. Yeah. yeah, it's a social linguistic uh, process, uh, and we we have a vast experience with uh, really translating, also um, monolingual <laughs> translation. Yeah, this in the social cultural respect uh, that uh, it, we call it accessible language. You know, and it works well if you. Uh, start with the term with the concept actually you know if, when you start with the concept and then uh, explain the concept explain the term what it means then yeah and then try to use simple language try to use accessible tr uh, explain uh, the scientific term I, I think I, I fully agree with Olga it doesn't make any sense to just skip the the, the technical term you know because uh, because then it, it uh, really it, it's too simplified it may lead to to misunderstandings and and uh, dangerous situations you know but to really explain in in simple short precise um, uh, sentences with the with ge in general daily language uh, what this actually means and uh, it it's uh, fantastic actually we I, I was I was uh, privileged to to work with in uh, the South African uh, government 15 years ago there was that great policy see that everything each and every every uh, part of society including life sciences uh, concepts and terms uh, shall be um, developed not borrowed from from English or Afrikaans yeah, but developed in these uh, former discriminated uh, um, indigenous African languages which was a huge challenge but with which was also great, you know, because people were so enthusiastic and, and we were privileged to, to support uh, these terminology groups and the creativity, the creativity was amazing, you know, how you can really build even in the very, uh, you know, discriminated uh, language, which was actually on, on the, in, in that stage of a rural, they, they could uh, express rural uh, phenomena. And, and, and we, we then, with these, uh, with the existing uh, skills and, and what we had, you know, in, in the language, uh, we, you know, developed these new terms. And, and it's amazing how far we went, you know, it, it refers a little bit to the question before when you when you're completely new in the market with the with a very you know different level of of, of language yeah you you have and this was amazing you know how how far you can go how uh, clear you can explain very very um sophisticated modern terms yeah, when you just focus on the concept and try to find an equivalent of the concept in that language you have you know in, in the general language or a language on the, on the rural uh, level and so it's doable of course it it needs a lot of uh, efforts and enthusiasm but it is doable and it's the only way we found out to get the buy-in from uh, from the users of course and the clients you know, because mm -hmm. they they want to see uh, uh, all the all the documents uh, translated in their own uh, you know uh, language so I think this is a success factor to be able to really translate uh, things also from different uh, uh, stages of, of developed languages. You know? You go ahead. I think we ran out of time. Oh, I, I was yeah. talking so much. So I, I warned you. you <laughs> So 
So uh, yeah, so indeed we we are running a bit out of time. So there, there we we just realized that there are plenty of other subjects that we would have uh, liked to cover. So for for sure there is room for maybe organizing a follow up webinar uh, on the subject for sure to 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 dig a little bit about uh, about regulations and certifications and also re reporting. So uh, I don't know if you want to sh uh, shoot out some final question, maybe Robert. Hear him. <laughs> we, we don't hear you, by the way. <laughs> oh, my bad. Um, yeah, I'm over here. Like, uh, yeah, no, we have a really long question sheet here. We have a lot of questions, but yeah, we ran out of time. But uh, maybe, maybe next time, um, you know, in a different panel, we could go more into the, more into the the processes and stuff. Um, you know, like like for example, testing translators that Renee was talking about, or um, some of the processes that Olga was talking about with um, the the huge multi-step process that we follow. So, but um, yeah, and I feel like we should shout out to Maladin because Maladin is his video is not on. Uh -huh. um, uh, I checked I checked what is going on here, and uh, it, it told me that camera that uh, webinar the camera has has reached the limit. So oh. <laughs> that's, the reason, that's the reason why I can't connect uh, by by my by my camera. Right, right. Okay. You, sh you should you should allow me. you should allow me to connect. <laughs> yes, so, yes. So I'm turning me off. Okay, now you turn you on, and then we'll say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Hey! Hey! Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Finally, unfortunately, welcome. Unfortunately, I, I had a small traffic accident on my way to the office, so that's oh, that's no. the reason why why I was no. late. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Yeah, Milan yeah, and I. So, so I, I, I had I had to wait for the police and to to do their job, and uh, that's oh. the that's the thing. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm good. Nothing happened to me, and that's, 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 the, most that's, that's the most important. And, and, thing. That, and that wasn't my fault. So that's, that's <laughs> the thing. But that, but that means that not, you are not in for video. <laughs> <laughs> what I, what yeah, I want, yeah, I mean. what, I, what I actually wanted to wanted to say that uh, when it comes to life science and uh, and uh, recruiting and all these processes, I agree with uh, with Gabriela. It's not. I think that Gabriele mentioned that it's not all about uh, about recruiting. It's about education, continuous education of translators. It's it's a continuous job of project managers working on their competencies uh, to be able to handle different uh, different um, uh, client uh, requirements, uh, to be able to to work with the uh, with the. Uh, Technologies which is which are constantly constantly evolving. That's that that what we see on our side in our daily daily operations in our daily business. Thank you, Mada. Okay, so we we'd like then to to thank you. So hopefully then uh, we we'll organize uh, sometime uh, soon some follow up session just to to continue our conversation and uh, all of the. The topics we didn't have time to to cover, unfortunately, and uh, we'd like to thank uh, thank you a lot for uh, taking the time to participate and to respond to some of the uh, the attendees' questions. So uh, thank you also for all of the attendees who participated. So we are sorry that we didn't have time uh, either to to cover all of the questions, but we'll we'll try to redirect them to the to our panelists uh, sometime soon. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Thank what you. a great thank pleasure. You. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye. 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 Yes. I hope your car is OK, Maladin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we will repair it. <laughs> it doesn't sound too good. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All the best.